Hi, I'm Krupa Sheth. I'm the Cabinet Member for Environment, Infrastructure and Climate Action at Brent. From Ackroyd Lowry, I'm Oliver Lowry. And I'm John Ackroyd. And this is Urban Forecast, the show where we talk to the people defining the future of our cities. We discuss their background, what drives them and the insights they've learned along the way. This is a podcast for anyone who's interested in how we live, work or play in the cities of the future and what that means for the built environment today. So, Cooper, thank you so much for coming in. Welcome to the Urban Forecast Thank you for podcast. having me. My pleasure. And so you were the youngest person elected to be a councillor in Brent. Yep, that was back in December 2011. With that amazing stat about you, I'd like to start from there, or maybe before then. What made you decide to even run at the age of 20 when I think most people were drinking cider and <laughs> <laughs> not living their lives? Local yeah. politics. Basically, it kicked off during reading week. I'd come home. I was doing nothing, pretty much, what most people do on reading week. And I was forced to go and help out my uncle, who was standing for the local elections in 2010. So how it works... Why were you forced? Who forced you? My mum forced me. She was like, (laughs) go and do something useful. Don't mope around the house doing nothing the whole week. Um, I really did not want to go. Um, It was also really cold. It was Feb. Um, but I forced myself out. Um, but yeah, local elections, 2010, we also have the general elections. Um, uh, I live in the Tokenton Ward. My uncle, Councillor Mohammed Butt, the then deputy leader, now leader of Bren Council. And we have a third candidate, Joyce Backus, who was running at that point. There were three seats in Tokenton, there are now only two. So yeah, I was forced to go out. Mo and my uncle were out there. And we've got a wide Hindu population in that area. And Mo doesn't speak Gujarati, so I was going around with him, translating stuff for him in Gujarati. And I think it was after a couple of days. Mo's got a great personality, so he knows how to bring you in. And it was just talking to people and listening to people that made me realise, damn, the local council has a lot of powers to do stuff. They have a lot of control. I think normally when we speak about politics, we see what's going on centrally around the world with a general government where we don't have a focus around local stuff. So growing up, I never realised what my local council did or offered. Everything I saw was what I read from the newspapers or saw on the news, which wasn't a lot about local council. So I think I found it really interesting to see what the local issues were, what mattered to local people. And I was born and raised in that area my whole life. So I took a particular interest in it. And what were those things that you were, when you were helping with the campaigning, you were presumably going around knocking on doors in 2010, what were the things that people in Brent, in Tonkington were talking about? I think things haven't changed that much in some ways. People always cared about housing. People always cared about a clean, green environment. People cared about the local parks. People cared about the local schools, making sure the children had the best education, making sure people had access to housing. I think those are some of the issues that are still prevalent now that they were prevalent back then as well. People wanted their roads fixed, their pavements done, and it also gave me an insight to how the budget with the council works. The money, the cuts that happened in 2010 were quite big for Brent. When the Conservative government got in and we were going on a downward spiral with things, Brent had to make a lot of cuts back then, and I think people really felt it and they could see it coming. So it was just a time to console people that will do the best for them. But just seeing the amount of issues people had, but also getting the thanks for the stuff that people did do for them, it just showed how much enthusiasm there is in the local community and how much people want that change. And so that was reading week. That was reading week. I never thought I would get involved. I started going out and helping out. I was actually coming from uni. I was in uni in London, so I was coming from central London back home quite often in the weekends, in the evenings, helping out Mo and my uncle, Councillor Kettensheth. And yeah, it just kicked off from there. And they all got elected in May 2010. I then joined the Labour Party shortly after. And yeah, I would go with them to events, community stuff. I started enjoying it. I was quite shocked at myself. Never thought that would happen. And then it was in November 2011, or just before November 2011, around October time, when we found out that one of our councillors was going to be resigning and there would be a by-election. And Mo at that time told me to put my name forward. I was just like, okay, this is not happening. I'm just a uni student with no experience. I've barely been with the Labour Party. There is no way anyone's going to take me seriously, but I was like, you know what, let's just try it out, let's see what happens. So 
filled up an application form. There was a long list, much to my shock. I was put on the short list after that. And so how it works is you prepare a short speech and then the party members from that ward, which was Wembley Central, will do a Q&A session with you after. So there were six of us on the short list. We all went in one by one, did a short speech, followed by a Q&A. And the members from that ward then vote to choose who they want as a candidate for the Labour Party for the Wembley Central by-election. I was absolutely stunned when they chose me. It was not something I expected. What was the Q&A like? Can you remember? Did they grill you or was it quite No, friendly? I mean, they were quite friendly. But um, I think for me, I had made it all about Wembley Central. I think whereas the others who had more experience with the Labour Party made it more about central politics, about the Labour Party in general. And I think what I had gone and done was went on to the local police, s and that's the senior, uh, Safer Neighbourhood team, went onto their website, saw what the local issues were and what the stats were for Wembley Central, went onto the council page, looked at the stats for Wembley Central there, got information out of Mo. So I was just doing my research around what the issues were in the local area, drove around the area, got a feel of it. I've been living in the area for so long, so I know what's around there anyway. And I made it all about the ward and apparently the feedback was from some of the members is that's what they liked. They liked that I understood what their local concerns were rather than just talking about the politics of it all. So I think for them they wanted someone in place who knew the local issues and would fight for them and get their voice heard in the council. So then you have to stand in, in an election? So yes, I was shortlisted or I was selected rather on the 22nd of Olymp- uh, November 2011. And the by-election was literally on the 22nd of December 2011, right before Christmas. So not the best timing for it. (laughs) But you spent a month on the doorstep, knocked on every door maybe, three to four times at least. We were out every day. We did two or three sessions every day. We have a borough organiser who does all our comms, our leaflets produces everything and all the councillors, all the party members come out and help. So this is still in your student holidays of your second year or something? Is yeah, that right? pretty much. So and were your university understanding that you were taking time out? They were really good. They were really helpful. Um, luckily, my exams had been done by then and there wasn't much to do. So it was good timing in that sense that it came across the Christmas holidays. But they were really supportive. I think they were really excited for me. They've never seen a student, obviously, become a counsellor before, so they were quite excited about it all, but they've, been, they've been, always been great throughout the whole time. But I think it was a reality check for me. I lost my life. I saw everybody else going out and having the time of their lives, and there was me stuck worrying about election, which I never thought I'd be fighting. So, yeah, it was really interesting. We came to election day. Uh, we did about two or three rounds. We were knocking on doors until 10 p.m., I remember just before 10 p.m. I was standing with Barry Gardner, who's the MP for Brent North, outside one of the polling stations, and we're just shaking hands. I think we had one of the last residents come up to me. She shook my hand. It was 22nd December, just about to strike 10 p.m., and my hands were freezing cold. She shook my hand, and she's like, your hands are really cold. And I was like, I was thinking, yes, I'm absolutely freezing. And she's, we have an old Irish saying, cold hands, warm heart. I now know who I'm going to vote for. So I was like, thank you, oh, one extra nice. vote. And yeah, after that, the polls shut at 10. The ballot boxes are taken to, back then, um, we didn't have the Brent Civic Centre. We had an old town hall on 40 Lane, just by Wembley Park Station. So I'm taken there. I remember I wasn't even allowed to go inside my own count. I was told to wait in um, the Labour Group office. I think they just wanted to make sure I'd won before. And then when they saw my ballots rising and they knew I'd done it, they all shepherded me into the room where the count was happening. And yeah, I think everyone was pretty excited. I could not believe what just happened. I think it took a few days for it to sink in, but yeah. So I looked at a press release from the time, which has an amazing photo of you <laughs> 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 looking yeah. very much like just a 10 year old student. <laughs> and you said you were delighted to have won and you wanted to focus on Fly tipping, I think that was one of the big issues. Yeah. And it was all those things you said, it was like clean, the sort of the appearance of the borough, the cleanness of the borough, the sustainability and housing. And so what was it like that I've mentally divided your career up into sort of pre-COVID and post-COVID? I don't know if that's fair. I started off as a backbench councillor. Wembley Central was a very tricky ward. When I got in, it wasn't probably the safest ward. It was marginal with the Lib Dems, so the Lib Dems were chucking a lot of work there. They were putting a lot of focus into it. 
I remember going to my first police meeting and the Lib Dems were there. I was the only Labour councillor there at the time, even though we had three other, we had two other councillors of mine, they didn't make it that meeting. It was my first ever meeting and I could feel the Lib Dems bashing and I kind of just learnt I'm going to have to push back and be a bit more forceful. I was only 20, so I didn't quite know how to do that. But I think over that course of that year, I found my way, learned how to push back, fight back, kind of start having more open conversation with officers in the town hall, speaking to the cabinet members that we had back then. Yeah, it took a while to embed into the whole thing, but slowly I learned how to deal with all the many different issues that was being chucked my way. And so what was your first cabinet role? I got into the cabinet in May 2018 and my first role was environment and back then I didn't have highways so my first role was around public realm, the cleaning of it, I had parks, I had stuff like mortuaries, cemeteries, rubbish cleaning, taking away all the bins, all that kind of stuff, the fun stuff which everyone always complains about, moans about. It was interesting. It was literally everything that mattered to my uh, residents in Wembley Centre. It was such a big deal for them. It was one of the biggest issues in my ward, so I was really passionate about it. I was quite happy to take on that role, even though I knew it would be quite challenging. I remember when I first got in, we had changed one of our policies, which was creating meadows in our parks, which meant letting the grass grow effectively. And I remember getting into Cabinet, and my inbox was streaming with emails. I was getting about five, six emails every hour about why is our grass not being cut? (laughs) And I was just like, this isn't even my policy. And I go to my director saying, we've got to sort something. We've got to think of something creative. How can, if we're going to do this and we're going to make meadows because we had to save money, we had to make the cuts. We've had to cut over a hundred million over the last decade. So it was just part of that. So I said, how do we make this into something more than just overgrown grass? What do we do to make this attractive? I was like looking and then I came across this thing where there were a lot of beautiful meadows out there in the countryside. I said, why don't we create a meadow? I sat with my officers, we brainstormed and we came up with an idea to make bee corridors. So we had about 22 meadows in Brent at that time and the idea was to find seeds which, are, which attract pollinating insects and create meadows across all our parks. And that became a huge thing. People in Brazil picked up the story and wanted to know what we were doing. So that was really interesting. And we had a lot of other councils really interested in our idea. And bees are so important. We created a bee corridor through that. So it became one of our big policies which attracted people. That was the first challenge. I remember that summer, all our bin carts broke down. Every single bin was basically being missed. I was getting emails in my inbox every second had to have some difficult conversations with contractors. So yeah, it was a challenge, but again, it takes a while to embed into the role and over time grown into it and over time more has been added into the role. And so you, obviously that environmental sort of thread runs through what, all the way till now and you were responsible for putting together Brent's climate emergency report, document, policies? So that was back in 2019, just before COVID. We declared a climate emergency at Brent and we decided to start putting together a climate strategy for Brent. And our first scope was to create a Brent, to form a Brent Climate Assembly. And we were one of the first London boroughs to do that. Or in fact, one of the first boroughs across or councils across the country to do it. We got external consultants to go out and find a wide range of people representing Brent from different backgrounds, different communities, different faith groups, different ages. People necessarily did not have an interest in climate emergency because we just did not want to bring in people who were already enthusiastic about it. We wanted to educate people and I think that's the part of the thing that we're trying to do in Brent. It's a journey because people don't understand the impact of climate emergency. So it's about bringing people along that journey and making people understand how they can make those changes to their lives. So we started off with the Brent Climate Assembly and through that we had five themes which we then put in our climate strategy and over that time it's developed. We had COVID in between with our path changed a bit but we'll continue to build that post-COVID. And so that's, that's where I suppose we, this podcast is usually about, you know, it's about future cities and, and the built environment and I think that's where we first came into contact was that overlap between the built environment and the climate emergency document that Brent has. Brent are obviously, I want to talk a lot about the amazing transformation in Brent and the vision that's been delivered over 20 years now, basically, 
But I just want to, before we do that, just pause on COVID, because I, I think that must have been a very tough time to be a counsellor. It was very tough. I think when it all happened, I don't think anybody, whether you look at local councils or you look at the government, knew what was happening and how to deal with it. And I just don't think it was our country, it was all across the world. No one quite knew how to get people through this. The first few months were very difficult. We had back-to-back -back meetings. We remember just sitting in front of the laptops on our desks from 8 a.m. all the way up until 10 p.m. trying to figure out I different things. I think Brent things. was quite badly hit as well, wasn't it? In that it first was really wave. badly hit. My officers had to build up her external mortuary outside of Northwood Park Hospital within 48 hours mm. because we didn't have enough places to store bodies, sadly. It was a really grim time. I think everyone came together, all our officers came together, all the councillors came together. I think we had a real close bond during that time and realised that we've got to work together with our residents. We formed mutual aid groups in pretty much every single ward. We had 21 wards back then in Brent and all the councillors were active in this mutual aid groups. We were helping people from delivering food, giving people packages, medication trying to get people signposted for any help they needed. So we're trying to do as much as we can from our laptop screens and inside our homes and trying to keep everyone safe. The parks, when people were allowed to go out and about, were becoming so populated, so it was a how do we manage that. The roles of all the officers changed. Enforcement officers who were normally out there catching people rubbish dumping and fly tipping were now patrolling parks to make sure people were safe. They were going onto the local high streets, monitoring shops, making sure all safety precautions were in place, the two metre rules, making sure that small shops don't have too many people going at the same time. Everything was about making sure that we got people safe, we made people safe, people were vaccinated. We're trying to do everything we could to push the vaccination stuff out. So yeah, everyone's roles changed over COVID. Those two years were really tricky. And I think after that, it took a while for people to get back into the normal roles, come back into the office and do what they were supposed to do originally. So yes, it was a shift, but we got there and got people through. It must have, because you mentioned budget cuts at the start, but it must have had a huge drain on the financial resources. And I, I think Brent's, you know, the annual budget of expenditure for Brent is in the billions, I think. Yeah. Um, but obviously a huge chunk of that for a year or two must have been diverted away from public services into sort of emergency response. Into emergency response, very much. I think everyone got hit by it. And then there's also just stuff around general income, which, you know, the council makes through other stuff, which was hit as well. Mm. All our local businesses were hit. Everyone was getting affected. And it was just the ripple effect that once someone gets affected, it all comes back. I think we're still seeing the effects right now. We've got the resident support fund that we've set up in Brent. And we've put so much money into it. We've put in around eight million already into it over the last year or two to help and support people who have been struggling with mortgages. We've been struggling to pay bills, just struggling with food and day-to-day -day stuff. I think we're still seeing the effects of it and a lot of our money is still going into the COVID recovery stuff to help people out. Yeah, that must have been hugely challenging. Obviously, I mentioned previously that I remember, I think I read a document from probably maybe 2010, setting out Wembley had happened, the arch was built, the stadium was opened in 2002, you just told me. And... From there, I remember going there and there was just quite a lot of uh, light industrial units around it, very little else. And you go there now and it's like a whole new city so has emerged. Growing there. up in Brent, there was literally nothing around um, to socialise with friends, to go out. We'd always go into Harrow or go into Ealing, but there was literally not very much to do in Brent itself. And as you said, it was around that time, 2010, where we started seeing everything come up and there was a lot more happening in Wembley. It was part of the vision. I think it took a lot of pushing. Mo was instrumental in that. He had a very tight vision as a leader of the council. And no matter what challenges he faced, he pushed through and he dedicated his time and efforts into making sure that vision happened, that the officers understood his vision and pushed it through, and that he embedded that message into us as councillors as well to understand why we need to do this and the benefits it's going to have for the wider borough, for the people who come in, for the people already living there. And we see it now. We see the opportunities in terms of job, growth, housing, stuff for people to do. 
people don't have to feel they have to leave the bar enough to do stuff to have dinner or to go and have a drink or to go and watch a movie these are the things that basic stuff that we could not do in Brent before and it's now on our doorstep and I think it's something that we're all really proud of and it is amazing because I think the, the documents must predate 2010 it must have been from just after Wembley setting setting out this vision and what that sort of allowed people to do is investment is Brent's just been of all the places in London I don't know anywhere that's transformed more rapidly and coherently and just delivering that certainty I think that's like I often you're actually the first politician who's come on this podcast but I often talk about the, like, the relationship between the built environment and politics and like place making which is a bit of a naff word but it, I think in the case of Brent it, it's or Wembley particularly it, you can dem it, de it demonstrably is place making because there was an absence of place before and there was a stadium plumped in the middle of nowhere and now there's a stadium in a town that sort of consistency, the guiding light, the vision, allows investors to coalesce around the vision and help deliver it. Obviously, it's something that's very conscious. What do you think it is that allows Brent to do that when other places struggle? I think when it comes to us as politicians, we always have issues when it comes to pushing forward new ideas. You have a lot of backlash from the local community. People sometimes don't always see your vision in the first instance. Sometimes it takes them a few years after even seeing it to understand the benefits of it and sometimes people won't understand it all. I think what happens a lot of times with politicians that they feel the backlash and they'll be like, we're going to take a step back. We're doing it to please the residents. But sometimes you've got, as politicians, they've given you the power to do what's good for your area and you've got to believe in what you've seen, the vision you've dreamt of, and push on with it, knowing that it is going to deliver good for the local borough, for the local people, and you have to continue sending that message across. And I think that's what we've done as a borough, where despite a lot of the backlash we've got, a lot of the pressures we've had, a lot of the challenges we've had, we've gone and said, this is our vision. We genuinely want to do better for our community, for the borough. We want to bring prosperity. We want to bring in more social housing. We want to bring in more affordable housing. We want to see the area boom. We want businesses to boom. We want to bring in families. We want to bring build homes for people that they feel they can come into Brent and live in. We don't want to just build anything. We want it to be a nice area where people feel, we want to raise a family here. We want to settle down over here, not just somewhere where people come and stay for a couple of years and then move out. And to do that, you've got to have the whole vision behind just building. And I think that's what we've done. And all of that puts in together, making our park safer, making our streets safer, making our parks more accessible for people, making the whole area just more open and livelier and friendlier. And I think also the, the quality of the officers that are then the gatekeepers of the design quality is important. So I think you've got that like, with Alice Lester yesterday. She's fantastic. And I think that the vision is set from the top clearly enough that the officers understand and encourage people that are trying to deliver within the borough i think yeah we've got we're really lucky we've got a great team of officers across all our departments they all work very closely with each other to push forward the vision we have obviously every election we have a manifesto commitments and our pledges and we turn that into our borough plan of what we want to see achieve brent achieve in the four years we are councillors the directors use that as their stepping point of what we want to achieve and with that in mind, they will go out with our vision and make sure that happens and they push that through their staff as well. So we've been really lucky. Do you think it's risky? The reason that other politicians step back when there's pushback is because there is the potential that at the next election, people change their minds because they don't trust that. Sometimes regeneration or always regeneration takes quite a long time. And there's the, the possibility that along the way people get frustrated not seeing change fast enough. I know I, was, I lived in Walsall Forest before and they're building several new towers in the town centre and there was a massive backlash because they just built the lift cores first. So nobody understood what they were, but these, there were these like 30 storey <laughs> concrete needles pointing up from the middle of town and, and people just went crazy about it. And I felt very sorry for eventually those are going to bring people back to the high street, bring footfall to the centre of town. But in the, mean, in the middle bit, it is. And Brent, like Wembley, had, for a long time was a lot, lots of cranes. How do you make sure that you're bringing the community on that journey with you to understand the vision at the end? 
So I think you obviously have to choose your battles with residents on what you push back on and what you don't. I think you've also got to be very open and honest with them. Sometimes they won't like that honesty and sometimes they'll be upset about it, but I think they always appreciate it. Having been a counsellor since 2011, I think that's the one thing I've realised. Having those open, honest conversations from the beginning and setting your mark and them knowing what to expect and you knowing how they're going to react, I think it's always the key. But I think the main thing is you always put out that positive comms, you send out that message. And we've done that, whether it's through our comms channels, whether it's through notice boards, whether it's through our Brent magazine that goes out every quarter, and even just going to resident meetings or we have our WhatsApp groups or when the residents come to your surgery. I think having those conversations with them face to face helps a lot, helps people understand what you're trying to do and what you're trying to bring. And I think slowly as this change happen, people realize it, they then, I think if you've done something really good and then you show it to them, they will understand. And there may be some backlash in the future, but people see Wembley and they see what we've brought to Wembley, the change from the shops, the cinema, the food and drinks outlet, the lovely homes I've created and the lovely community that now live there. I think, yes, people always will have issues around some stuff to do with planning and high rises and building, but people see the area safer, it's more livelier, they feel more warm in the area and welcomed. And I think people have lived there for, you know, since the 60s and 70s. Yes, it's a big change, but it's a change that, you know, they're beginning to adapt to and because it's done genuine good for the area. And so on the other hand, how do you engage with developers to make sure that they understand their vision? I think that's one of the things that I that comes up a lot on this podcast is talking to mostly talking to sort of developers and those discussions around how you engage with politicians, but you as a politician, how do you want developers to engage with you? They're obviously crucial in delivering the vision. Most of, it's, most of that is being done by the private sector. How do you make sure that they are aligning themselves to your vision? So I think on most occasions when we've had big developments coming up, they've always contacted ward councillors. They've always said, this is what we're trying to do. What are your views and opinions on it? And that's when, as ward councillors, you're always out and about in the community. You know what the concerns are from your local residents. You know what they're going to bring up. It's your chance to have the conversations one-on-one with the developers about what the local issues will be, what the local noise will be, and what you expect from this, and what you want to see happen in the area. And I think that's the perfect chance for you to figure out how you can implement some of your ideas as well as some of the developers' ideas and turn it into a big positive for the local area. Do you think overall that the built environment or the professionals in the built environment, developers, consultants, are good at listening? Are, Are they good at... In Brant, for example, you've got a vision, but it's reasonably broad, I suppose. I think there's, there's areas for, for interpretation. Do you think that they are good at, at listening and making sure that their designs do tick those boxes, hit those goals that you're, you're trying I to set I think for out? the most part, I think where it doesn't always align on the first occasion, after a few conversations in the right direction, I think they begin to realise what our vision and priorities are. And I think they realise that they're going to have to change their ways a bit if they want to come into Brent. I think you always have to meet somewhere halfway, right? So sometimes you've got to compromise, sometimes we've got to compromise to get something good out of it. Yeah, and I do think that is, there's, there's several boroughs that I think are very open and transparent and want to have a, a dialogue in advance of an application going, and I, I think Brent's definitely one of those. I had one more question, sorry. So you mentioned cuts before. Cuts are coming up again, I think, in the autumn statement. I don't think the cuts have ever stopped, to be honest, since 2010. But I think there seems, for the autumn statement figures to make sense, more cuts are going to be passed down to the local level. What more is there to give? And what happens if if your budget's cut? Are there ways that the council can go about raising additional money? Or are you going to have to cut services? Or is this not a question that you want to answer on a podcast? So I think... With Brent, we made a lot of difficult decisions in 2010. That's when Labour first got in into power in Brent after a few years. And we made a lot of tough decisions. We got a lot of unhappy residents, a lot of complaints. We dealt with a lot of difficult situations back then. So I think we're in a better place compared to other councils. You look around the news and you see a lot of councils 
across the country, collapsing or on the verge of collapsing. Mm. You see the stories drum up in the newspapers every day. It's scary. We mm. talk about it all the time ourselves. We look at, um, just today we we're discussing the cost of living crisis. We're discussing the resident support fund where, as I mentioned, we've put in around 8 million so far to support residents with their bills, mortgages, food. We've been supporting stuff like food bank initiatives and other stuff to ensure people have access to food, but it's getting more and more difficult and challenging. And with more and more cuts, there's less money that we can put into initiatives like this. It also means that a lot of the core services get scrapped. For example, environment got hit really badly back in 2010. I still deal with the impact of it too now. Everyone, the first thing they see when they walk out is their bins, the streets, their parks. Are you, their mowing, the, are you mowing the parks or are they still meadows? We mow a lot of the parks, but a lot of them are still meadows as well. So that's not changed. But yeah, you have to be creative on how you do stuff. For example, with environment, we've changed the way we clean our streets from having a scheduled sweep every week we now base it on intelligent lead cleaning we have officers out and about we have our contractors out and about and where we realize the streets need cleaning after a week some need clean after two weeks we'll do it in that way we won't just clean it every day or every other day or every week because it's on the schedule because the resources don't allow you to do it anymore it's how you do things which will have minimum impact on the residents but at the same time, get the main services delivered. But yes, um, a lot of the services will get slashed over the years to come. Um, it's going to be a difficult um, time. I can't see things easing up any time in the future. So it's just the case of how we deliver the best services um, with all the cuts coming our way. And got to remember that a lot of the budget for a lot of the councils goes towards the adult social care and children care side because they're fundamental statutory services that we have to provide. We don't have a choice over and that sometimes can cost you just 10,000 a week on one person. So, yeah, it's difficult for sure. And I think it doesn't feel like a change in national government will make much difference because I think part of what the Tories seem to be doing in the run-up to election is leaving little time bombs that is hard to unwrap. So it's, it's going to be hard for an incoming Labour government to, to start I don't, yeah. channeling money back in that's now been turned off because how do you fund that? It's a long hill upwards, basically. It's not going to be a short win. You can't just click our fingers and expect everything to change just because we've got a Labour government in. But, yeah, it's going to be very difficult. I think, slowly, we're going to have to reassess how we're doing stuff nationally, locally, even looking at NHS, looking at housing. We've seen the demand that we have for housing, how we deal with that as well. All of these are questions that we're going to have to look into really deeply. We're seeing post-COVID that... The baby boom that was there a decade ago is no longer there. We don't have all the school places filled up and we're now even looking to close down schools mm. rather than opening schools. So times are changing in that sense. So it's how we reevaluate priorities and what we make a priority and that vision basically going forward. And if you, we didn't really talk much about national politics, but if you were coming into part of that government when it eventually comes in next year, what would I be, like your optimism. <laughs> well, I, I think in one way or other, it's gonna, even if it's a minority government, I think Keir Stunwell will probably be the leader in, regardless. Yeah. What would be your primary thing that you would think would make a, a difference for the local politicians like yourself? I think as a new government, they're going to have to figure out a way to invest in local councils. I think that's going to be the main thing. I think it's what affects local people so much. Mm. And we're at the point where we just cannot cut any more out of the service. There'll be nothing more to provide. So we really have to reevaluate how that funding settlement is done and how that money is used because without that proper funding settlement from central government, I think we're really going to struggle in Brent and across all the other boroughs and across the country. And I think, yeah, I totally agree. And I think they really, local government is so underrated and so under-talked about considering that it's... It's the back to my earlier point. I had no idea until I went yeah, out on yeah. the doorstep what local government actually did. And that's day-to-day -day bins, etc. But then also local plans... Oh, if you are now you have to have a new local plan and it, how do you invest in that if you haven't got any money like it's so important for the for taking the example of brent transformation through regeneration you need resources to, to deliver that and if you're cut back to just doing the mandatory services then there's you're not even going to be able no, to it doesn't invest work. and you're not it, going to be able to start building up the sort of the economy based around investment yeah it is, it is. And i think this is what a lot of people don't understand about local government the amount of stuff that we actually have to do on a day-to-day -day basis from the local plan 
the borough plan, the consultations, everything we do, it all requires time, a lot of resources to go into it. And if we don't have the adequate staffing, then it doesn't happen. Oh, I feel like we're finishing on a negative point now, but um, I, I think um, my, to, to be more positive in conclusion, um, I think that transformation in Brent is amazing. Uh, Mo, I think, is a really visionary leader. I mean, we're transforming so many areas across Brent. We've got the Alperton area now, we've got the Wembley area, we've done so much amazing work in South Kilburn. So it's all coming up really well. So if, you want, if, you, if developers wanted to get in contact with you, how would the best way be to approach if they had a site they wanted to bring forward have got any tips of how to get in contact drop me an email i'm on my emails 24 <laughs> 7 uh, we can set up a meeting we're always very welcoming in brent and we're more than happy to have more people coming in and investing in the borough and making it a better place for everyone amazing thank you so much for your time thank you thank you if you enjoyed the show then please subscribe and give us a review ideally a five star one And if you want to know more, please go to AckroydLowry.com or follow us on Twitter at AckroydLowry and Instagram with the same. This podcast supports LandAid, the property industry charity that brings together the sector to deliver life-changing projects for young people who really need it. Visit www.LandAid.org to find out how you can help end youth homelessness.